Hello, good afternoon, sir.
good afternoon nikit hi jenny jenny good afternoon uh, nikit dr ali will be joining in few minutes okay. hello hello yeah uh, is that dr gosia yes yes yeah, yeah. Do uh, jennifer just said that dr ali will be joining us in a few minutes so i think let by four know. we should okay let me know if i can put you guys uh, you live when uh, sir is joined back i think uh, he's here but he uh, okay, you know, okay. When he comes on camera then we will go okay but anyways it's getting recorded i don't want to go live uh, unless you are ready yes so, i'll yeah. take two seconds to go live okay Usually, what happens is uh, they were discouraging me to go on li uh, li live because uh, you know the attendees we wouldn't know. Okay, but it's better we go live. Okay, and then I'll share the link with you, and you can put it across as well. Sure. So, would they be able to? Uh, would people be able to put in their queries, questions? Yes, yes. YouTube chat as well as Zoom also. In this chat section, they can put. You can also call. I mean, ask for it once uh, the people start joining. I don't see anybody waiting in the room. I have made you co-host as well as I've made Dr. Ali Khwaja also co-host. So y'all also can put in people, you know, as they, as you see in the waiting room. Okay, right. But if there are any uh, comments or questions in you, on YouTube, I wouldn't be able to see, right? Would you be able to? Yeah, I'll text you. I, I'll do that. Very rarely we have any questions on YouTube, but anything like that, I'll just update you. Yeah, done. So we have six more minutes. Yeah. Are there any questions or uh, uh, certain topics that people would like? I'm curiosity as to understand, you know, what is being spoken about. Like, you know, I think that's why the questions are very less. Because uh, I also didn't want to reveal what is being spoken about, you know. Okay. <laughs> It is a difficult topic, I mean, for people to even ask questions, that's what I'm thinking. So I'll make Dr. Nair also as co-host, just in case. Uh... Yeah, it would be nice to have uh, some of you all also on uh, camera. <laughs> sure. Yeah. 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 So you can, you know, jump in where you feel that yes, there, yes. Is, there is something to add or, you know, where you we could get yeah. Dr. Ali's inputs. Dr. Nair, will you take us uh, live on YouTube or how is it? We are waiting for Dr. Khwaja to join us. Like, he's here, but sharp four, he joins. Like, uh, so Asalaamu Alaikum. Uh, I'm a bit outside. Uh, I think I don't have the access to the laptop. So because of this, I think I may not be able to take I'll a do. live YouTube. I'll do that. Yeah. I'll do. Hi, Ali. Shall we wait for another four minutes and then start? Because it's 3.56. Yes, Nikhat, you are a banja, right? You know our policy. Yeah. On time and on time. So we don't start four minutes early. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and that is the reason I'm I'm watching my clock very closely. Yes. Only thing is that if you want, I will take a pledge that I will tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Done, done, Ali. Uh, but but then we are not in the court court, court proceeding. <laughs> <laughs> Doesn't matter. We're not... Dr. Nair says we're not in the court proceeding. Yeah, yeah, but all proceedings have to have the tooth. <laughs> yes, without tooth is not possible. Yes.
And anyway, you are the lawyer, you are going to interrogate me, no? So I yes. have to say the pledge before I answer the questions. Yes. So I can play the devil's advocate also. Ah, correct. The tooth advocate. Yes. I know that you've done a lot of programs for dental colleges, right, Ali? Yes, I have. I have. I think we start. We have two more minutes, but you can go YouTube live by by all by that time it happens. No, I am going with this an internal server error. So, but anyways, the things are getting recorded. So, live okay. is not happening because of some internal error. Okay. Because I think the recording was started off early. Okay, so which you can later upload on YouTube also. Yes, yes, yes. yes. It's four okay. Yes. It's four on the clock. Ali, for the first few minutes, you will have to today allow me to call you Dr. Ali Khwaja. <laughs> Done. Good evening, everybody. Uh, I feel extremely honored and humbled to have my mentor uh, guide um, my therapist and more than any of that. Uh, he's just Ali to me. I boast of learning uh, dentistry from the best people. I've had some fantastic teachers all my life, but none who has wanted my growth more than what I have wanted for myself. And that's that's Ali. Just to let you all know a little bit about Dr. Ali Khwaja. He's a Montessorian, an engineering graduate of Institute of Science and IIT Bombay with a PhD in behavioral sciences. He has always carved out his own path and been a freelancer, ensuring that work is joy every day. He is invited regularly to conduct workshops or lectures for defense, central government, national institutions, schools and colleges, but he prefers to be informal, learning while he teaches and being honest and congruent in whatever he says or does. He's the founder and chairman of Banjara Academy, a unique institution committed to enriching life through empowerment. He trains people from all walks of life to reach out to others and provide emotional support and leads a large team of counselors who give free service in person, on phone and through email. He conducts a very popular and practical one-year program of which I am a student, the Diploma in Counseling Skills, four-month certificate in child and adolescent development and other online courses. He has written over 30 books and 80 booklets on all practical aspects of day-to-day -day life and writes regular columns and articles in reputed publications and edits a unique newsletter, Banjara Life. Notwithstanding all that, he loves all human beings alike, is willing to listen, and his prime focus is on empowering individuals to help themselves. 
welcome here ali on this forum just to tell you a little bit about the forum it is formed by a very dedicated team of dental professionals extremely passionate about their work and not just that but also of very very generously giving away knowledge so welcome and uh, today's topic has been stressful for everybody from what i hear from dr gosia also i'd like to mention here dr gosia is the lady behind today's uh, program uh, she wanted me to reach out to you uh, she's very very interesting and special to me because she is a pediatric dentist who works and who has a specialization and works exclusively with children with special needs yeah uh, the topic for today is stress and i'm sure over these decades of years of your practice you have met so many dentists that i know and don't know of and i i think you would be able to share more uh, on the areas of concern that you have figured out and then of course along the line i will you know my journey and i will be able to probably pitch in and tell you more right can i start on a very light hearted note to uh, bring emphasis on what is stress and how we deal with it there was this young man who had a small job and used to get a salary one particular month what happened was that he suddenly needed an amount of money let's say 10000 rupees and he didn't have that money so he went to his neighbor who was his very close friend and told him can you lend me 10000 rupees as soon as i get my salary i'll pay you back he was a good friend and neighbor he said okay fine he gave him the money end of the month, on the last day he went to office and he found that his employer has shut down the office and run away so he has lost his job and he doesn't have money for that month that he had worked now how does he repay to his neighbor he was a very conscientious man and he knew that the neighbor had helped him so he went around looking for somewhere to get money and pay him days went past the neighbor started getting restless he says i know you lost your job but that's not my problem you have to arrange something or the other and give it i am also not such a rich man that i can afford to do without this money he started putting pressure and this man started getting more and more stressed out one early morning the neighbor came and knocked on his door and said i am giving you 24 hours by tomorrow morning this time i'll come here and if you don't give me the money you see what i'll do to you and he walked off now you can imagine this man stressed he had no means of getting that money he had nothing to sell nothing to mortgage nobody who would give him a loan yet he tried the whole day he went looking around for the money didn't succeed came back exhausted tired and just plonked on the bed his appetite was gone he didn't feel like eating and he was tossing and turning tossing and turning in the bed his wife asked him what's the problem why don't you sleep he said what do you mean what's the problem you know what this fellow said you know that tomorrow morning he is coming and uh, he has told me that somehow i have to give him the money she said did you put in all your efforts to get the money he said i swear upon you that i tried every possible means i could not raise that money One o'clock in the night, that fellow woke up, opened the window, and said, "Yes, what is it?" He said, "Sorry to disturb you. My husband took a loan from you. Yes, he had promised to repay. Yes, he has been you know, extending, and he has not paid you. Yes, you lost your patience, and you have threatened him that you have to pay by tomorrow morning." He said, "Yes. So what?" no not so hard i just wanted to tell you my husband spent the whole day looking for that money just could not get so i just wanted to inform you that tomorrow morning when you come you can do anything to him but he will not be able to pay you the money and she closed the window turned around and told the husband 
Now he won't sleep the whole night. You better go to sleep. So this, according to me, is what is stress. Please remember, stress comes from within. People have financial problems, but they're not stressed out. People have health problems, they're not stressed out. People have a dentist appointment, but they're not stressed out. So you have all types of people who go through various things, but they don't get stressed out. And yet, there are so many people who do get stressed out. So what you need to do is to identify your stressor and look to see how you can reduce it. There are situations where you say there is no solution to this stress. Let's say financial. I need money. I just don't have any way to get the money. So what solution are you talking about? That is when I always recommend the second step, which we call as the worst case scenario. What is the worst that is going to happen to you? When you clarify that to yourself, it doesn't look as bad as when you were vague about it. So when you come to that conclusion that this is the worst that can happen, think of what is the possibility of that thing happening. What are the chances? And you may say, it's not 100%, maybe 60% it will happen. But 40% it may not happen. So why am I worrying now? In fact, somebody has very nicely said, anxiety, you know what is going to happen in the future. I've got this problem, I've got that problem, I'm having to tackle these challenges. So I'm very anxious about the future. Somebody very rightly said, anxiety is the interest that you pay on a loan which you have not taken. Think about it. It is the future. The worst can happen, the best can happen, something else may happen, may not happen. But sitting and being anxious, sitting and worrying about it is definitely not the solution. So if we can understand that two things, one is to solve the problem. Wherever there's a possibility of solving the problem, obviously that has to be the first and the most uh, you know, obvious uh, uh, solution to it. But in case for any reason you're feeling there is no solution, I will not be able to deal with this challenge. In that case, how is life going to be? What I said about the worst case scenario. This may happen, that may happen. How am I preparing myself? And lastly, what can I do to bring down the stress? I may not be able to change the scenario, but what can I do to bring down the stress? Because stress not only does not help in dealing with the situation, it actually makes it worse. Psychologists have given us very clear indicator that the higher your stress level, the less are the chance that you will be able to find a solution. So bring down your stress. Now somebody will ask, how do I do that? I have a very simple answer. You have to find your way of de-stressing. There is no one size fits all. Somebody does meditation. Somebody goes by prayer. Somebody does yoga. Somebody does a vigorous workout. Somebody talks to a counselor. You have to find out which is the best way to reduce your stress. Over to you. So there's an immediate question in the chat bot, uh, Ali. Yes. Anxiety is the interest of loan that I have not taken? Yes. Because so, you're hmm. worrying about the future. The future will come tomorrow or next week or next month or next year. So when you are worrying, what you are doing is you're paying interest. You're raising up your stress. You're becoming dysfunctional. As it is, you have a problem, which, as I said, could be a financial, it could be relationship, it could be legal, it could be relationship, anything. But it is of tomorrow, not today. That's all I'm saying. Uh, in terms of stress also, Ari, 
uh, none of us, I think, would be able to function without a healthy amount of stress. Oh, yes, yes. Particularly that very in... obvious. That's very yeah. obvious. That when we talk about stress, the correct technical word for it is distress. Yeah. There is a thing called EU stress, E U S T R E S S, which is the good stress. D I S T R E S S, distress is the bad stress. But in day to day language, when we say stress, we are actually meaning distress. So, as you said just now, certain amount of stress is good. If I have taken a loan and I have to repay it, the stress. Now, as long as it is used as I work harder, I will say I have to pay this loan. I have this financial liability. So that makes me work harder. But what happens is if you land up in a situation where you feel I will not be able to repay that loan. And that's a mental state, mind you. If you come to us thinking that I will never be able to repay the uh, loan. That is when the you stress converts into distress. And that is what I said. In that situation, your functionality comes down. Even if there was a possibility of some solutions, you cannot think of those solutions because the stress is so high that you get into what is referred to as a fight or flight syndrome. Either I fight, I get into uh, arguments, I get into conflict, or flight, meaning to say running away from this situation. Neither of them helps. Yeah, uh, in very specific for dental for dentists, an anxious patient can be extremely st stressful. Yes, which you know, so knowing the patient's anxiety could help in planning better. That may that may be called as a good stress. But what happens is when you're seeing 10 anxious patients through the day, back to back, you know, that, that's when it becomes chronic stress. And uh, and of course, it's, it's a very, uh, like I have spoken to you earlier, um, there's a lot of precision involved. There's a lot of expectation from the patient's end. There's also expectation of the self. Perfection is not just a demand in dentistry, it's sometimes even a necessity. And I think that is one of the reasons for major burnout among dentists too. Yeah, yeah. Would you like to add something about that, Ali, in terms of <clears throat> managing perfectionism, Correct. which you cannot avoid also? That's right, that's right. Now, you said that a dentist has to work with, let's say, 10 anxious patients. The dentist knows his capability. He knows that he is qualified, he's experienced, he's competent, he can do that procedure. But when an anxious patient turns up, he starts getting flabbergasted. The anxiety of the patient rubs off on the professional. And that is where, as I told you, you lose your sanity or your peace of mind and you tend to make mistakes. You tend to say things which you did not intend to say, which the patient catches hold of and throws it back at you. Now, one very interesting thing I wanted to tell you. See, as you mentioned, 40, 50 years, I have been only working with human beings. I don't work with uh, you know, dentists or doctors or engineers or lawyers. I work with human beings. You will be amazed to know that every group of professionals that I work with think that their professional is the most stressful. Nobody else faces the type of problems that we do. And our problem does not have a solution. Just to give an example, if I am talking to, let's say, public sector executives, government companies, they listen to me very politely and then they say, sir, what you're saying is very good, but that is applicable only in private companies. You see, I work for a government company. Here, these things don't apply. Fine. Next day, I'm in a private company and I'm telling them the same thing. They say, sir, in some government or public sector and all that, this can easily be practiced. Not with my boss and the type of uh, company that I work uh, uh, in. So doctors will say the same thing. Police officers will say the same thing. Lawyers will say the same thing. 
So let us accept and understand that you are not unique. Yep. You have the same type of, and, and when I'm saying uh, you're not unique, I'm talking purely from the human end. So you may be unique in the sense that you require what we call as fine motor skills, which maybe mm -hmm. in many or most of the profession do not require. So that is where your challenge comes in. So if you are concerned about that, that my fine motor skills are not good, I might make a mistake. I may make the patient bleed or I may do a wrong procedure. Then that's a technical matter. I have nothing to say in that. You have okay. to go to your seniors, your teachers, whoever they are, upgrade yourself, see to it that you learn the correct uh, techniques because you know that one of the most important skills for a dentist is what we call as fine motor skills. However highly qualified you are, if your fine motor skills are not good, you will continue to have problems and you will have anxiety and stress. Now, if that is taken care of and your issue is of the fact that somehow I seem to be landing up with 10 patients and nine out of those 10 are you know, anxiety ridden and they are not very nice to me, et cetera. I want you to ask a simple question to yourself. I'm sure you know among your friends and colleagues, certain dentists who do not face a similar situation. At the end of the day, you, they say, yes, I had very good patients. I laughed and joked with them. I had, you know, communicated with them and then I did the procedure. In one or two cases, something slightly went wrong. I apologized. I told them, you come back, we will rectify and all that. At the end of the day, I'm happy. Mm. But if you find that you are getting 9 out of 10 anxiety-ridden and stress-giving patients, I think you need to look inward. You mm. are not getting patients who are from Mars or Venus. They are also patients from this Earth. And human behavior is the same. One of you may be dealing with very poor patients from illiterate sector. One may be dealing with very sophisticated and high level uh, patients. Behavior, human behavior is the same. So here I'd like to give you one or two very simple tips. The first thing is smile. You had mentioned smile in your uh, thing also. I want you to look in the mirror or more than that, ask your near and dear, how much do you smile? And smiling is a learned phenomenon. Okay. Smiling is a learned phenomenon. Dr. Nayad says dentists and uh, physicians are said to be more stressed out. Just yesterday, I had the director general of police with me and she said, nobody is as stressed out as police officers. She has spent 35 years in the police uh, uh, force and risen to the highest rank. Now, is she telling a lie? Is she telling the truth? And this is one example because it happened yesterday. 10 days back, there was somebody else who was saying that, you know, I work in this, this, this sector and nobody is as stressed out as me. Now, this is a thing which I want you to please rise above. The moment you take up, there may have been some survey, somebody may have done the, all these uh, things. But the moment you start actually believing that nobody is as stressed out as doctors and dentists and you are a dentist, automatically your stress level goes up. Your coping ability goes down. Never compare yourself with others. Because there are subsets also. Within dentists, you may have a colleague who, is, who deals with educated and sophisticated people. You practice in a locality where there are illiterate people. Now, it's very easy for you to say, what problem do you have, boss? You are dealing with educated people. They are much better to deal with. My problem is like this. Immediately, the other one will say, no. The well-to-do people, the educated people, they are the worst because they expect you know, wonders. The poor people at least are mild and they accept whatever you tell them. They look up to the doctor who is right and who is wrong. So first thing I request is stop comparing. Even if you have read somewhere, even if it's an actual survey, please knock it off. You can't change your profession just because doctors and dentists have more uh, stress. You can't go and become a lawyer or a journalist or whatever else, right? So you have to accept 
that I have stress and I will tackle it. I will deal with it. Have that positive attitude. Do not compare with others. Uh, taking forward from that, uh, Ali, uh, again, these are discussions that we've had over a period of time when you say that, you know, people with fine motor skills need to, you know, uh, take up fields like dentistry and surgery. But unfortunately, the, the education doesn't system allow for that. And there is not much awareness around career assessment. Even those that are doing are doing mostly aptitude tests without, you know, actually understanding, like, unlike what Banjara does, the real, uh, you know, skills that a profession needs. And for many of us, dentistry has been a second choice. Yeah. Or rather, it's sometimes not even a choice. Fair enough. Fair enough. No issues. See, do not look back at the past. Do not regret decision that you have taken. I'm sure if there are a hundred uh, dentists in your uh, group, there will be at least 50 or 90 different reasons why they became dentists. And there will be different skills. We are not bothered about numbers. We are interested only in you. So you have become a dentist. You have qualified. Most of you already have many years of experience behind you. You have been actually practicing in your uh, uh, profession. Now is the time to sit back and think. If your stress level is very high, I told you, what are the possible solutions one of the solutions is, can I move into something else? Like what Dr. Nair had put up uh, uh, just now, that if you feel that dentists have the maximum stress, nothing preventing you to move out of it, the immediate answer that comes is, I have studied so much, I have practiced for so many years, I have invested so much, of my life, energy, everything into it. At this time in midlife, how do you expect me to change? It's not that easy, Ali. You can't do it overnight. That's what you will tell me. I know that. What I'm saying is, I'm not asking you to change tomorrow. Yeah. I'm asking you to set long-term goals. If you are 30 years old or 50 years old, you still have 30, 40 years of working life ahead of you. Yes. I would like you to throw a little more light on short-term and long-term goals. That's right. That's right. I'm doing that only. See, whenever you are under stress or whenever you feel that I'm not going in the right direction or I would have liked to do something better. See, today you are much more knowledgeable than you were at 17, 18 years of age. When you decided to take up BDS as your course, you, most of us, let's uh, admit that we don't know much at that age. And as Nikhil said, most of these so-called aptitude tests and all that that I come across are very mechanical and very, very, you know, down to earth. They, they don't really look into the human aspect of the uh, thing. Anyway, what I'm saying is dream, dream big. Tell yourself, maybe I have whatever, 20 years, 40 years of working life ahead of me. Towards the end of my profession, when I feel I'm now old enough to retire, what would I like to be doing? So you may get an idea. You may say, I would like to open an orphanage. My heart goes out to children who don't have parents. I may like to work with special children as Nikatos mentioning about the colleague. I may want to teach in dentistry or write books or documents related to health, not restricted to dentistry. Think of every possible thing. Take the next few days and start writing down every possible option. Don't think, how will I do it? Your long-term goal could be that I will set up a huge campus where all old people whose children are not looking after them can come and uh, you know live there happily. Where will I get that type of money to do it? No, that you don't worry. 
Right now, you put that down as a long-term goal. One, two, three, four, five. List out all of them without wondering how you will achieve it. Long-term goals should be very lofty. And they give you that inspiration, that motivation to deal with the challenges of today. Whenever you're upset, as you mentioned, you have 10 patients in a day and 9 out of those 10 were not very nice to you. And at the end of the day, you're feeling miserable. You're feeling exhausted. You're feeling stressed out. Lie down, close your eyes and think. 30 years from now, I will be running this huge campus for senior citizens. I will be setting up a university where dental education will be completely redone to make it much more uh, practical. I will be doing this, I will be doing that, whatever, okay? That helps you. Then the next step is start taking small steps. Set small goals which give you momentary relief, which bring down your stress from 100% to 90%, that is enough. I have seen this happening to people that when the stress starts reducing by some active efforts, the enthusiasm that you get makes you work harder, gives you a positive thinking uh, pattern. So set these small goals. It could be something as simple as my nephew is not studying properly. In my free time, I'll go to my sister's house and spend half an hour with my nephew, teaching him in a different way so that he gets motivated to study. That's a very small uh, goal. The next test takes place and where he was getting 40%, he gets 60%. You get that feeling that, yes, I have achieved something. Anything, you think of it by uh, yourself. And each one of those short-term goals should be taking you one step towards your long-term goal. Try it out. Innumerable people have done it and they have seen the change from within, not in one day, one week, one month. It takes months. Sometimes it even takes years. But your quality of life will change. And this you know, transformation that you are coming out is more than a change. Change is reversible. Transformation is permanent. So the day you start feeling lighter, the day you start feeling, I can handle the stress better than what I was doing yesterday. I can look forward eventually, whenever it happens, I can look forward to a better quality of life. See how your quality of life today changes. And this also includes, since I am being doing, you know, career guidance and aptitude assessments and all that for donkey's years. It is not impossible for people to bring about a complete change. Some of us are stuck saying that if I am qualified as a dentist, I should be a dentist the rest of my life. I'll tell you one thing. If you have done any professional course, you may have done engineering, you may have done law, you may have done MBBS, you may have done BDS, whatever. You have done a professional course as contrasted to people who did a BA, BSc, BCom, BBA. You are one step ahead of the others. You, in the college, you may have been taught with regard to your particular specialization. But those four, five years that you spent in college also taught you how to handle projects, how to work with a team of people, how to tolerate nasty uh, teachers, how to, you know, take up that strain of tests happening every now and then. Uh, then that is what you have learned. So using that, people can move on. If you see, for example, in the last 30, 40 years, since I have been in the profession more than that, engineers have always succeeded in whatever they did. Engineers have made good financial experts, economists, IAS and IPS uh, uh, officers. Engineers have been done wonderful in mass communication. 80 to 90% of the people who get admission into IIM, the top management schools, are engineers. Give a thought, why did that happen? Because 
engineers don't restrict themselves to their profession. They look beyond. Unfortunately, dentists restrict themselves to their profession. Or if they think of change, they think my education will be wasted. My so many years will be wasted. I assure you it will not be wasted. It has made, given you a strong foundation. You may not be able to change tomorrow, but as long as you're working towards the change, think of anything which is as different, as you know, wide from dentistry as possible and start working towards it. It's just a question of time that you will be able to achieve it, provided you feel that, no, oh, I've put in enough years, the stress, these, whatever I'm facing. I don't think I can continue like this for years and years like this. So I would like to have a different opinion on this. Uh, that's right, Ali. Uh, one other reason is because most often we also work in solo practices. So exposure to other fields, professions, and areas of work is limited. And hence, it again goes back to my stress is the highest, which I wouldn't deny there is also. But I know I have cried umpteen times to you about, you know, uh, workplace stresses. Uh, but having worked where I am currently working with children with special needs, and I see the work that the teachers, the trainers and therapists put in with you know, children with special needs, I feel there is there is <laughs> there is no more stress and no more challenging role than exactly. that. Imagine the anxiety of people who cannot communicate yeah. and need to physically pull you apart to have you understand uh, you know, what they're going through. Yes. Yes. You heard the proverb that I cried because I did not have shoes. Till I met a man who did not have feet. Yes. Think about it. There's always somebody who is worse off than you. That's why I told you sometime back. Don't think that you are the only people who are under this type of uh, you know stress. Um, Everybody has in different formats. But how yes. does it matter to you that you let us even accept that your stress is more than the stress of all other professions? By declaring that, what are you gaining? You're only making yourself further pulled down. No? You say, I am a dentist. I have to handle the stress of the dentist. That's it. Or so, I need to move out from this profession. Not tomorrow, maybe next year, maybe five years, ten years from now. But you can do it. I think there's a related question on the chat, chat box that says, ah. when dentists have lumbar and cervical spondylitis, then they are not able to deliver the quality at 40 years of age, which is quite depressing. Yeah, correct. So now that you are aware of it, let's say you are not 40 and you come to know that your seniors are going through. Did you give it a thought? I know for a fact that those who are in their 30s and still very active and earning well and getting good name in their profession, they don't even think what is going to happen to me 10 years from now. And 10 years from now, when you do start getting spondylitis and all that, then you start wondering, what am I going to do? So I have a request to all of you. The best time to bring about a change is when change is not absolutely necessary. You are surviving. You have not shut down your practice. You have not gone bankrupt. You are facing financial problems, spondylitis problems, whatever it is but you're still working. You're a qualified professional doing your work, getting satisfaction, at least from some patients. Some patients will never be happy whatever you uh, do. Now, today, what can I do to bring about the change? That's why I said that having that you know defeatist attitude that what else can I do? I'm only qualified as a dentist. That is not true. You have so many other skills. Have you even thought of it? During the uh, lockdown, you know, Nikhat knows that a number of women who were in different professions decided to become home chefs. And they started this, yes, started this catering um, service, right? 
Now, when did they do it? When it became absolutely essential because they were locked up at home and there was no way they could do dental practice. But what happened once the lockdown was lifted? Vast majority of them went running back to their dental practice. They didn't even give a thought. Supposing I develop this for another five years more. I have the talent. I have the ability. I am an excellent cook. And cooking doesn't give me spondylitis. So if not now, right now I'll go back to dentistry because I have a clinic, I have this, I have that. But can I plan out that five years from now, 10 years from now, before I get hit with all these physical problems and mental problems, can I slowly start moving into something uh, uh, else? That Those are the people who succeed. There's another question that says, effective time management in managing or handling stress. Yes, that's, in fact, not being able to manage time is one of the prime factors of stress. People who say that I have got so much to do. I have seen doctors, not only dentists, even the other form of uh, physicians and uh, all that. They take up too many patients and they can't handle them. Then the patients are getting imp impatient, so they can't tell them to go away. By the time they finish the clinic, they are dead tired and they come back home with aches and pains. They've earned money. They've done successful uh, uh, work, but they are not happy people. So if your time management says, I can deal only with six patients, why not do it? The other question that comes in is, I have EMIs, I have loans, I have to, okay, reschedule those EMIs. See whether if you are paying one rupee per month, you can do by paying 80 paise per month. All these are possible. Many a time, people have not even thought about it. And if they've thought about it, they haven't taken the courage to go and talk. I've had many people whom I, I have a colleague who's very good in finance matters, who's also our counselor. So whenever somebody has come to me saying that I have this EMI problem and all that, I put them onto him. And he says, yes, you can renegotiate the loan. If that fellow realizes that you will not be able to pay, he gets into bad debt. He will not allow that to uh, happen. So if, he, if it is within his powers, if he understands the importance, he may allow you to pay 80 paise, your stress has come down. Now instead of 10 patients, you're dealing with eight patients. You also have free time, which you can decide, would you like to spend with your family, which is a great de-stressor? Would you like to take up a hobby? Would you like to take up some activity which can eventually become you know, a, a money earning proposition like these home chefs that I mentioned uh, to you or whatever it may be? What I am trying to tell you is not from any textbooks. It is not theory. It is what I have observed practically in depth since the last half a century. When others can do it, there is no reason why you cannot do it. But it takes that positive mental attitude. Stop comparing, face the challenge straight away, and look for ways and means to reduce your stress, have long-term goals. See the results after a few years. There's an interesting question from Dr. Neha. She says, how can we best manage personal and professional stress and try best not to mingle both? Yeah. Because maximum time, either of it affects the other. Very true. I'm glad you have realized that some people don't. You know, they go back home and tell their family members, you don't know how busy I am. You don't know how the patients treat me. You don't know what all I have, have to do. You're not. Why should they understand what you deal with the patients? It is your chosen profession. You are being paid for it. Your spouse, your children, your elderly parents, they have nothing to do with uh, it. Why should they be kind to you? So what I suggest, particularly to the ladies, you know, there's this wonderful person called Indira Nui. She was the CEO of PepsiCo, one of the Fortune 100 companies. At one point when she had two teenage daughters, she was just not being able to handle professional uh, uh, stress and dealing with the teenagers. 
she called her mother over from India to spend some time with her. Her mother stayed with them, observed the whole situation and gave her a very simple advice. She said, Indra, you go, work hard, work as much as you can. But when you come back home, when you are putting your car in the garage, remove your crown and put it in the car and walk in. Crown meaning you are CEO of a huge company. You have to forget that and say, I am a mother. I am a homemaker. I am somebody's spouse. The moment you start thinking that way, it starts reducing. Then, instead of taking out your you know, the stress on them, another thing which I always tell uh, busy professionals like you, when you finish your clinic and you are going home, you are probably already late. You had wanted to be home at 8 o'clock to have dinner with the family. It's already 8.15 or whatever it is. So what do you do? You rush home and you land up with higher level of stress. Now that you have already spent 15 minutes or 30 minutes extra, at 8.15, 8.30 when you are going home, take 10, 10 minutes out. Go and sit somewhere and sit and sip a cup of Irani chai. Or if some park is open, go there and just sit in the park and watch. If you are a music lover, put on some music and sit in, in your vehicle or whatever it is and listen to that music just outside your house before you walk in. That 10 minutes of de-stressing can do wonders. Ah, without guilt, that's difficult. Yes, I agree. But what is this thing called guilt? Like I told you about stress, guilt comes from within. Nobody can make you feel guilty. It is you who feel guilty. Be guilty. We also don't... Be guilty. Sorry, Ali. Hmm? I said, sorry, uh, just to interrupt. We've been conditioned to feel guilty, to take care of ourselves. Ah, particularly ladies. Ladies, yes. So you have to start the process of reversing the uh, thing. If you try to hide whatever I told you now, take that 15 minutes extra. What do you do? You don't tell your family members. Because you're scared that they will say, why are you so late? And if you say I was sitting in the park for 15 minutes, they won't like it. Have the courage to tell them. I did not want to come and get into arguments or unpleasantness with you people. I love you all. I want to come back with a nice smile on my face and with open arms. I knew that I will not be able to do it because I had accumulated so much stress in the uh, clinic. So I am doing it. You get angry with me, you do whatever you want, but I will do it. And the result will be, I assure you, I will come with a much more loving, caring attitude towards family. You can even tell them that despite this, if you find me walking in, in a grouchy mood, push me out of the house and say, come back after 15 minutes. I'll go and distress myself somewhere and I'll come back. This is possible. People have done it successfully. You can also do it. There's also a comment from Dr. Tabasum who says, from COVID, I have become a social worker too. Uh -huh. It was stress reliever then and now. Alhamdulillah, the happiness I get doesn't beat any of my other work. Exactly. Allah opens ways on our uh, to help on our niya. Absolutely. There's no doubt about it. This is what we've seen. We have this organization called Helping Hand, where we have got 300 volunteers who work in 10 different hospitals of the city. They just go once in a week for two, three hours and just help out the patient by filling in forms, guiding them where to go, just sitting and listening to them when they say, my mother is very sick, I'm worried about her and all these things. When they uh, go on, what happens is that out of all the seven days into 24 hours, this three hours acts as a great de-stressor. So here is one opportunity. Any one of you can spare three hours once a week. Come to us. We'll send you to a hospital where you are not going as a doctor. You're going as a volunteer. You need not even tell anybody that you're a doctor or dentist or whatever it is. You just say that here I am as a volunteer. I'll fill up your form to you. I'll talk to you. If I see somebody is very thirsty, I'll get a glass of water and I'll give it to you. 
do that and see how it happens. That's what I'm saying. You have to find your own way. Somebody is. I would, uh, mm -hmm. I would like to add over there, Ali, yeah. being part of Banjara and witnessing the work that Helping Hands, uh, uh, volunteers of Helping Hands do. Uh, that's. Uh, it has been one of the most amazing and you know life changing experiences to see people in their seventies, eighties, nineties wheelchair bound do this work and still have a childlike attitude to them. Yes, yes. That joy, that happiness, Ali, I have not seen anywhere else. Absolutely, absolutely, and totally stress free. That's what I tell our volunteers, the patients who come to the hospital are unhappy because they had to come there, they are sick. Their caregivers, family members are unhappy because they are worried about their loved one who is being admitted to hospital. The staff is unhappy because they are stressed out, they are overworked, they are running, they have to be, you know, they are responsible for uh, uh, lives. You are the only ones who can come leisurely, smiling and whistling as you walk into the hospital and as you walk out of the hospital. And when you look about and see those hundreds and thousands of people who are so unhappy, you realize what a great life you are leading. I wanted to share with you one of our 80 year old uh, volunteers. He lost his wife of 52 years. And the day she died, he completed all the formalities and the cremation and everything. And next morning, he was back at the counter in the hospital. He says, this is where I belong. What will I sit at home and brood? Being, uh, you know, cured and going back home. It's wonderful for me. Until his last day, he worked as a volunteer. Yeah, it's it, someone has to witness that. One has to experience that, uh, I think, too. To completely feel that. Sorry, your voice is cracking. I, I said one has to truly witness that. One has to experience that. Absolutely. absolutely. That That's why we tell people there's no commitment. Come, do it for a few days and see. And this is only one of them. I told you, no. you're a music lover. You get into uh, that. I have one of my counselors is an amazing singer. You can't make out whether, you know, Kishore Kumar is singing or whether he's uh, uh, singing. So uh, this uh, next uh, Friday he has organized just out of his own pleasure. He's a busy person otherwise working and all that. He has organized what he calls as Qadar Khan Night. Qadar Khan, as most of you may know, was an amazing person. He was a writer, he was a script writer, he was an actor, he was a multifaceted person. So just in his remembrance he said, I'm going to do this. And it's open to anybody. You people come spend two hours with me and go back. This is what it uh, is. And last time I remember when he had done a uh, program, we had one Dr. Mukesh, you know, <laughs> who came to listen and then said, I will also sing. And he sang two wonderful songs. Dr. Mukesh is none other than Nikat's father. Yes, and he still remembers, recalls, and uh, you know, it still gives him joy. He's not keeping good health, mind you. He's not. Yeah. Well, he was a very, very busy practicing doctor, and now he has had to give up all that because of his health. But these are the small things which keep him going. Yeah. And if somebody can do that at 75 years of age, I'm sure you people can do it at 35 or 55. I will read out some comments here, Ali. Sure. Uh, yeah, we are coming Dr. to the end of the hour. Yeah. So go ahead. Dr. Ga uh, uh, Tabasum says, Gaza shows us the same beautiful patience. How in the face of adversity, Palestinians are still rejoicing the little that they have. Very true. Dr. Neha yeah. says, you have a dream, but because of some impossible situation, you're not able to fulfill it. Yes. It is being stressful. But if you give up on that is also stressful. How would you deal with such situations? It's just an example, it may not be dream, it just flashed with me the word dream. Yeah, whether it's a dream, whether it's an ambition, whether it's something you know you always wanted to do, but have never been able to do, or whatever it is. 
when you say that I have not been able to fulfill that dream, you are talking with a time constraint. As long as there is life, there is opportunity to fulfill that dream or that goal or whatever you ambition, whatever you want to uh, call it. And there's another factor to it. I can do it in bits and pieces. Whenever you set goals, also break up that goal into smaller pieces. And that, now we were talking about doing, say, social service. I know of one doctor who's very busy, very... from his practice. But he made up his mind that one patient every day, I will treat free of cost. That's it. And they don't even know. He just sees and he asks, you know, what do you work as? He says, I'm a coolie here or I'm this or I'm an auto rickshaw driver. He says, don't pay anything. Next time you come, I'll uh, see about fees. He says, I feel so nice. I don't know how many patients he deals with in a day, 20, 40, whatever it is. But that he makes it a point that at least one patient, I will not charge. He gets that satisfaction. I mean, this list is endless if you just use your imagination and work on it. And that is why I'm saying, don't say if you cannot fulfill your uh, goals or your dreams. It's just a matter of time that you will be able to do it. Um, I know we have short of time, Ali, but two things that I you know, would like you to just sort of touch upon also. There's a current fear gripping among generally healthcare professionals, uh, dentists too, uh, regarding medical legal, medico legal cases. Yes. And um, that's one thing that, you know, I wanted you to sort of uh, touch upon. And also the other thing is whether we look at a, a patient with a tooth or a tooth with a person. That's right. I'll tell you the first one. Uh, yeah. I have been reading this up in various research papers. Uh, the doctors, I'm not saying specifically dentists, but the doctors in the West. And the West, as you know, there's much more of litigation and suing and all this uh, uh, thing. So somebody did a very, very extensive research and found out that the doctors who get sued most often are the ones who are serious, who are grumpy, who have an unsmiling face and who talk matter of fact about the illness. Right. Another doctor who may not be as efficient, he may actually be making some mistakes in the treatment, but he smiles. He welcomes. He offers somebody a glass of water. He tells that person, oh, it's very hot. How did you come? Did you come walking or do you have a uh, vehicle? Explains the procedure that this is what I'm going to do. It may be a little painful here, there, and something like that. They are the ones who are least likely to be sued by patients. This has been proven by surveys and research. Despite that, why not take precautions, find out what is the... I'm not an expert on that, but I know people... make ...that rich that if somebody... Finally, manages to sue me, I have to pay. It is just increasing in India. I've not get, got many, many cases. I've had very few cases. And surgeons and all that. I think the percentage of people who are actually facing legal problems is, uh, you know, overplayed a little in uh, India. You have one case like that and it blows out of proportion. And 100 doctors or 500 doctors start worrying what if it happens to me. And again, it adds to your uh, stress. What was the second question? A patient with a tooth or a ah, tooth That is something which I'm very, very particular about. That you are dealing not with tooths attached to a patient. You are not even dealing with patients attached to a tooth you are dealing with human beings who incidentally today have a dental problem. Tomorrow you may meet the same person. You may be running a shop and you go there. You are his consumer. He's selling something to you. You may be 
meeting somebody for some property matters and all that, and he may be a lawyer. So look at people. That's why I told you in the beginning, when a person walks in, don't think of him as a implant case or a, what do you call it, uh, you know, filling case or a extraction case. Don't even look at him as a patient. Look at him as a human being. What? And I would doing? highly recommend doing the Diploma in Counseling oh Skills Program at Bandar <laughs> Academy. Not yeah, because... Those of you who are in Bangalore are most welcome. You can come. Yeah. And, uh, you can just come and chat with us. I'm not even saying that you have to make that commitment or whatever it is, but come and chat with us. Keep that. As I told you, Louis, sometimes you don't know. I've had people who met me 10 years back. And at that time, they were so busy in whatever profession. They said, oh, this is something wonderful. I would like to do, but no way I can do it. I've got a small child. Or I'm busy with my work. Or I stay too far away. Or whatever was the reason. 10 years later, they come. And they say, come on, let me have something to do. That's how it goes. Yes, and I keep endorsing the program. Uh, not that Banjara Academy pays me for it. But simply because I know how much I have benefited from it, and I I have seen that ripple effect in so many people that uh, you know I I believe that teachers and doctors need to go through that transformative experience for themselves to be able to help their you know the people they are dealing with. Yes, don't even think of yourself as a doctor or a dentist. Think of yourself as a human being. You're somebody's daughter or son, you're somebody's brother or sister, you're somebody's neighbor. In your mind, at least, minimize this thought that I am a mental, a medical professional or a dentist or whatever it is. That's what Indira Nui's mother said, keep your crown in the garage and come home. Do that. Yes, we have one more minute left. Very mindful of the time, although I love this inter discussion and I would like to go on forever. But uh, with because of the shortage of time, would uh, Dr. Nair or Dr. Garcia like to add a final comment or anything before we wind up? Uh, we're really honored actually to have uh, Dr. Ali and uh... In uh, having this session with us and uh, in perspective of uh, managing stress and then handling stress on a day to day basis. And then the different uh, perspectives of individual patients and uh, corresponding to the professionals and the individual professions as well. Uh, there's a lot of uh, learning involved. Uh, but then having said this, I think uh, we have to individually, it is, I think when we talk about stress, it is very individual and it's very relative to an individual. You cannot generalize stress to one particular individual and compare it to the other uh, person's uh, stress levels. So when we say this, I mean, uh, uh, depending on the scenarios and in, uh, individual perspectives of an individual going through a particular scenario or a circumstances, due to various reasons, whether it is a socioeconomic uh, status or professionals or a personal, uh, at, uh, personal things happening uh, in his or her life. So the stress perspective itself is very relative. So there is no comparisons involved. I think uh, like uh, Dr. Ali rightly said and pointed out that we have to I uh, isolate and then individual uh, individually as to how exactly we can identify the causes or etiology of the stress levels and then manage it accordingly. It can be like uh, Dr. Ali said, pointed out, like it can be anything. I mean, like uh, you are uh, find a new hobby or start working out or uh, how, how things work or individual point of view. Uh, but then uh, again, uh, we come across a lot of people, individuals uh, across uh, life. And then I had a recent uh, patient, you know, who was very happy. And then he gave five star ratings and then everything. And then he was very happy. And then he used to give us gifts and all. And then eventually he landed up suing me, uh, claiming that I have not done anything. So you come across these sort of patients as well. So again, uh, there's no limit for stress. But uh, how exactly we define stress as good stress and bad stress, it's up to individual perspective, right? Uh, but then yeah. this was a very informative session. Uh, we are really thankful for uh, Dr. Ali and uh, Dr. Nikhat to moderate this session. And uh, if there are any other participants who are willing to put in their points or views, uh, we are open. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Nair. Thank you, Ali. Thank you Thank for you your know. time. Thank you for these, yeah. these yeah. your valuable thoughts. My pleasure. Yeah. You didn't say despite my busy schedule. But <laughs> it's always despite my busy schedule. <laughs> 
Okay. All right. Have bye a bye. Nice bye. You too, Ali. Bye bye.